On the blocks of Sacsayhuaman there are clear tool marks, and guides are usually eager to point them out. At the same time, they are rarely mentioned either by representatives of mainstream science or by proponents of alternative views on ancient stoneworking methods. These traces appear as white dots on the surface of the limestone. More precisely on micrite, a variety of limestone composed of very fine calcite crystals. The simplest interpretation is that they were formed by impact. At the moment of contact, a network of microcracks develops together with a local temperature spike, leaving a light mark. Alternative explanations try to link them to side effects of geopolymer setting or exposure to high temperatures. One might expect that in both camps these marks would be used as important arguments, yet this does not happen. The white dots remain largely ignored. There are no publications dedicated to their origin and not even official analyses of their structure. Let's try to understand why. And we will begin with a set of systematic observations that may allow us to draw some conclusions. First, the white dots are visible only on certain blocks, those composed of dense micritic limestone with numerous white veins. They are absent on stones with less uniform structure and also on blocks made of other rock types such as granite, andesite, or diorite. The first question concerns their origin. Can the white spots be considered the result of surface treatment rather than a natural phenomenon? Yes, the marks on the blocks are definitely man-made. On untouched bedrock outcrops, white spots do not occur. One might attempt to explain this by differences in the stone structure, but within the same section of bedrock an area that has been worked may contain white spots, while the unworked area does not. There are also no spots on fractured surfaces of the blocks, including places where the adjacent areas contain many of them. If they were produced by natural processes they should also appear on the fractures. And if their formation required time, they might be absent on fresh breaks but should be present on older ones that have already changed color with age. An additional observation. The frequency of the dots changes depending on the quality of the surface finish. The closer they are to the joint line between blocks, the denser and smaller they become. If the origin were natural, the distribution would be uniform. These two facts, the absence of dots on natural rock and on fractures, and their varying density depending on proximity to the joint, indicate that they are connected to material removal. Can we assert that they were caused by percussive working? Indeed, striking limestone creates a network of microcracks that produces local lightening of the stone. And at first glance, this seems supported by areas of modern tool marks, where the surface is densely covered with such pale spots. But in reality, ancient and modern traces differ. Let us examine the distinctions step by step. If we assume the white dots result from direct blows, then the tool had no teeth, like a bush hammer or tooth chisel. Otherwise, we would see repeating rhythmic patterns, well known from examples at Coracancha or Baalbek. Nor was a flat edged chisel used. Bronze tools are hard enough for limestone, but they leave a different kind of trace seen on the blocks today as the result of modern work, where the surface is cut by continuous passes. The dots do not form regular clusters, they are individual and independent. This leaves only the possibility of work with a sharp stone or a rounded stone hammer. Obviously, neither option is suitable. A stone hammer with its rounded edge cannot produce such small dots. And when working with a sharp stone, it is difficult to imagine that each dot corresponds to an individual strike. Moreover, real work with a sharp tool would produce scratches rather than dots, especially in hard-to-reach areas inside recesses. For dots to appear, each strike would have to land strictly perpendicular to the surface, without any sliding, something that is hard to achieve even intentionally, and impossible to obtain accidentally. Therefore, the white dots cannot be explained by percussive surface treatment. And indeed, in a restoration photograph the replaced section of the masonry includes a block with white dots, but above it lies a block bearing typical chisel marks in the form of long, continuous scratches. The block with dots is a reused element. Its edges are roughly broken off, and those broken edges show no dots. This means the dots are ancient, not modern. All modern traces have a characteristic scratch in appearance, and do not match the ancient ones. Viewed under a microscope, the white dots are not zones of microcracking from impact, but localized porous formations surrounded by a micritic matrix. Thus they differ from impact marks, not only in appearance and distribution, but also in structure and even composition. 
private analyses show a weak, chalk-like microstructure. This is likely why they are never cited as evidence of percussive work in academic literature, and why they remain unstudied. It can also be noted that the distribution of white dots matches the textural transition of hard stone surfaces at worked areas. The surface gradually shifts from rough, with depressions, to almost polished. This suggests that the method of working diorite and limestone followed the same principle, but limestone preserved the traces much better. So how could such marks have formed, given their connection to surface working, and to the quality of block joints? An important point. The white dots are not isolated, thin veinlets extend from them. Larger white veinlets are typical of blocks that also contain dots. Since calcite in fracture zones can recrystallize under moisture, we can conclude that white dots appear only where the rock is prone to recrystallization. This is why other types of blocks do not have them. Therefore, the white dots are not the result of individual blows at each point, but an indicator that the entire surface was, at some stage, covered by a network of microcracks. Subsequent working could have been carried out with simple tools on rock of reduced strength. Over the following centuries, the nodes of this crack network gradually transformed into white dots through calcite metamorphism. Geological data suggest the breakdown and alteration of the original micrite into a recrystallized microfabric through long-term dissolution and reprecipitation processes. A convincing confirmation is the presence of extremely small dots right along the very edge of the joint. These cannot be explained by microscopic tool strikes. Their existence is entirely consistent with a natural post-crack process. Equally unconvincing are the tiny dots inside a recess. If they were the result of impact, one would have to assume that this area was intentionally worked far more thoroughly and with a much smaller tool. Such an assumption cannot be considered credible. The distribution of white dots aligns well with natural phenomena of point-based growth, such as freckles, or siliceous spicules and silica spot formation in limestones. The general principle is the same. Structural moisture and chemical heterogeneities create our favorable microzones where localized growth develops. It is clear that natural processes do not produce distributions as uniform as those seen on the Sacsayhuaman blocks, which again points to artificial influence on the rock. It is reasonable to assume that similar weakening techniques were applied not only to limestone, but also to harder rocks. This would have made it possible to scrape material off without significant tool wear and to produce recesses of uniform width even in andesite or granite. After shaping the microcracks healed, in andesites and other volcanic rocks, the processes differ from those occurring in limestone. Nevertheless, at the time of working, the rock may have been subjected to a weakening effect that facilitated its shaping, and this now creates the impression that the workmanship was inexplicable. It is hard to imagine a deliberate method capable of producing such uniformly shaped recesses as those at Coracancha, or the markings on the block at the Cerro Capilla Quarry, where instead of a scratch there is an actual carved depression in granite. This could also explain the strong weathering seen on many polygonal masonry surfaces, leading to exfoliation. Such weathering is not present on natural talus blocks, but it is characteristic of worked surfaces. If the structures were thousands of years old, earlier cultural layers would have been found underneath. Official dates may contain uncertainties, but not by millennia. Yet the weathering looks exactly as if it were much older than a few centuries. The fact that, in Peru, where there is no frost, hard rocks show active decay may indicate that the stone did not fully regain its original strength and became more vulnerable. But how could the rock have been weakened using available techniques? The first method mentioned in the literature is fire. Micrite is sensitive to heating even at 150 degrees Celsius. Due to its low thermal conductivity, only a thin surface layer heats up, insufficient for calcination but sufficient to produce microcracks. At first glance, this seems plausible, but inconsistencies arise. It is difficult to imagine a process in which the entire surface is systematically heated with torches and then hammered. Soot marks would remain. And even if limestone is heat sensitive, granite and andesite are not. They exfoliate under high temperatures or under repeated heating cooling cycles, but this causes irreversible fracturing, whereas the process requires reversible micro damage. It is highly unlikely that the upper andesite courses of Coracancha were repeatedly heated and several millimeters removed each time. The traces show that the stone was weakened to a depth of several centimeters. 
Fire cannot weaken such a layer evenly and reversibly. Fire creates uncontrolled and irreversible damage. For precision joints, the degree of control must be exceptionally high and must not irreversibly destroy the rock. Additionally, fire would affect not only protruding surfaces but also recessed ones. Yet, in the vast majority of cases, recessed areas do not contain white dots. Of course, one could discard the idea of weakening the stone by generating microcracks, and instead explain the presence of white spots not as the result of individual blows to the surface, but as a consequence of structural disturbance in the areas being worked where the spots formed in zones of accumulated damage caused not by single impacts but by their superimposition. This corresponds well with the fact that white spots do not appear on unworked surfaces, whereas if we assume weakening of the rock through microcracking, they should occur everywhere. At the same time, a combination of these factors cannot be ruled out. Weakening alone would not, without additional impact in the form of blows, lead to the formation of recrystallization nuclei. In the case of pure pounding, many questions related to stoneworking remain unresolved, some of which have already been raised in a separate video. For example, how and why was a constant width of auxiliary cutouts maintained? Why are they so numerous if they were merely layout marks? Why preserve ridges between elongated recesses? How could such sharp edges be created on brittle blocks using impact-only methods, and why, if the edges could just as well be rounded? Why fit even the smallest details together with precision? How can the strong cavernous roughness of the surfaces be explained, given that every blow would have to remove relatively large fragments of stone, which means that the time expenditure would be completely different, not 300 cubic centimeters per hour, but an order of magnitude more. This would imply the production of one block per hour, and so on. Thus, finding an answer to the question of how rock strength could have been reduced, and whether this was done at all, requires separate analysis, which will be presented in the following videos. Conclusion The white dots on the Saxayuaman blocks are traces of surface working, not a natural phenomenon. They do not correspond to percussive methods. The most plausible explanation is surface treatment that created a network of microcracks, which then metamorphosed over many years. This suggests that the surface was intentionally weakened before final shaping. The cracks later healed, and the rock regains strength, possibly greater than it had at the moment of working. Thank you for watching. See you next time.